The Swift Programming Language, 5.6 edition, copyright by Apple, published under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Closures. Closures are self-contained blocks of functionality that can be passed around and used in your code. Closures in Swift are similar to blocks in C and Objective-C and to lambdas in other programming languages. Closures can capture and store references to any constants and variables from the context in which they are defined. This is known as closing over those constants and variables. Swift handles all of the memory management of capturing for you. Note, do not worry if you are not familiar with the concept of capturing. It is explained in detail below in Capturing Values. Global and nested functions, as introduced in functions, are actually special cases of closures. Closures take one of three forms. Global functions are closures that have a name and do not capture any values. Nested functions are closures that have a name and can capture values from their enclosing function. Closure expressions are unnamed closures written in a lightweight syntax that can capture values from their surrounding context. Swift's closure expressions have a clean, clear style with optimizations that encourage brief, clutter-free syntax in common scenarios. These optimizations include inferring parameter and return value types from context, implicit returns from single expression closures, shorthand argument names, and trailing closure syntax. Closure expressions. Nested functions, as introduced in nested functions, are a convenient means of naming and defining self-contained blocks of code as part of a larger function. However, it is sometimes useful to write shorter versions of function-like constructs without a full declaration and name. This is particularly true when you work with functions or methods that take functions as one or more of their arguments. Closure expressions are a way to write inline closures in a brief, focused syntax. Closure expressions provide several syntax optimizations for writing closures in a shortened form without loss of clarity or intent. The closure expression examples below illustrate these optimizations by refining a single example of the sorted by method over several iterations, each of which expresses the same functionality in a more succinct way. The sorted method. Swift's standard library provides a method called sorted by, which sorts an array of values of a known type based on the output of a sorting closure that you provide. Once it completes the sorting process, the sorted by method returns a new array of the same type and size as the old one with its elements in the correct sorted order. The original array is not modified by the sorted by method. The closure expression examples below use the sorted by method to sort an array of string values in reverse alphabetical order. Here is the initial array to be sorted. The sorted by method accepts a closure that takes two arguments of the same type as the array's contents and returns a bool value to say whether the first value should appear before or after the second value once the values are sorted. The sorting closure needs to return true if the first value should appear before the second value and false otherwise. This example is sorting an array of string values, and so the sorting closure needs to be a function of the type string, comma, string, returning bool. One way to provide the sorting closure is to write a normal function of the correct type and to pass it as an argument to the sorted by method. If the first string, s1, is greater than the second string, s2, the backward function will return true, indicating that s1 should appear before s2 in the sorted array. For characters and strings, greater than means appears later in the alphabet than. This means that the letter B is greater than the letter A, and the string Tom is greater than the string Tim. This gives a reverse alphabetical sort, with Barry being placed before Alex, and so on. However, this is a rather long-winded way to write what is essentially a single expression function, A is greater than B. In this example, it would be preferable to write the sorting closure inline using closure expression syntax. Closure expression syntax has this general form. The parameters in closure expression syntax can be in-out parameters, but they cannot have a default value. 
Variadic parameters can be used if you name the variadic parameter. Tuples can also be used as parameter types and return types. The example below shows a closure expression version of the backward function from above. Note that the declaration of parameters and return type for this inline closure is identical to the declaration from the backward function. In both cases, it is written as s1 string s2 string returns bool. However, for the inline closure expression, the parameters and return type are written inside the curly braces, not outside of them. The start of the closure's body is introduced by the in keyword. This keyword indicates that the definition of the closure's parameter and return type have finished and that the body of the closure is about to begin. Because the body of the closure is so short, it can even be written on a single line. This illustrates that the overall call to the sorted by method has remained the same. A pair of parentheses still wrap the entire argument for the method. However, that argument is now an inline closure. Inferring type from context. Because the sorting closure is passed as an argument to a method, Swift can infer the types of its parameters and the type of the value it returns. The sorted by method is being called on an array of strings, so its argument must be a function of the type string, comma, string returns bool. This means that the string, string, and bool types do not need to be written as part of the closure expression's definition. Because all of the types can be inferred, the return arrow and the parentheses around the names of the parameters can also be omitted. It is always possible to infer the parameter types and return type when passing a closure to a function or method as an inline closure expression. As a result, you never need to write an inline closure in its fullest form when the closure is used as a function or method argument. Nonetheless, you can still make the types explicit if you wish, and doing so is encouraged if it avoids ambiguity for readers of your code. In the case of the sorted by method, the purpose of the closure is clear from the fact that sorting is taking place, and it is safe for a reader to assume that the closure is likely to be working with string values because it is assisting with the sorting of an array of strings. Implicit returns from single expression closures. Single expression closures can implicitly return the result of their single expression by omitting the return keyword from their declaration, as in this version of the previous example. Here, the function type of the sorted by methods argument makes it clear that a bool value must be returned by the closure. Because the closure's body contains a single expression, s1 is greater than s2, that returns a bool value, there is no ambiguity and the return keyword can be omitted. Shorthand argument names. Swift automatically provides shorthand argument names to inline closures, which can be used to refer to the values of the closures arguments by the names $0, $1, $2, and so on. If you use these shorthand argument names within your closure expression, you can omit the closures argument list from the definition. The type of the shorthand argument names is inferred from the expected function type, and the highest numbered shorthand argument you use determines the number of arguments that the closure takes. The in keyword can also be omitted because the closure expression is made up entirely of its body. Here, $0 and $1 refer to the closure's first and second string arguments. Because $1 is the shorthand argument with the highest number, the closure is understood to take two arguments. Because the sorted by function here expects a closure whose arguments are both strings, the shorthand arguments $0 and $1 are both of type string. Operator methods. There is actually an even shorter way to write the closure expression above. Swift string type defines its string specific implementation of the greater than operator as a method that has two parameters of type string and returns a value of type bool. This exactly matches the method type needed by the sorted by method. Therefore, you can simply pass in the greater than operator and Swift will infer that you want to use its string specific implementation. For more about operator methods, see operator methods. Trailing closures. If you need to pass a closure expression to a function as the function's final argument and the closure expression is long, it can be useful to write it as a trailing closure instead. 
you write a trailing closure after the function calls parentheses, even though the trailing closure is still an argument to the function. When you use the trailing closure syntax, you do not write the argument label for the first closure as part of the function call. A function call can include multiple trailing closures. However, the first few examples below use a single trailing closure. The string sorting closure from the closure expression syntax section above can be written outside of the sorted by methods parentheses as a trailing closure. If a closure expression is provided as the functions or methods only argument, and you need to provide that expression as a trailing closure, you do not need to write a pair of parentheses after the function or methods name when you call the function. Trailing closures are most useful when the closure is sufficiently long that it is not possible to write it inline on a single line. As an example, Swift's array type has a map method which takes a closure expression as its single argument. The closure is called once for each item in the array and returns an alternative mapped value, possibly of some other type, for that item. You specify the nature of the mapping and the type of the return value by writing code in the closure that you pass to map. After applying the provided closure to each array element, the map method returns a new array containing all of the new mapped values in the same order as their corresponding values in the original array. Here is how you can use the map method with a trailing closure to convert an array of integer values into an array of string values. The array 16, 58, 510 is used to create the new array 1658510. The code creates a dictionary of mappings between the integer digits and the English language versions of their names. It also defines an array of integers ready to be converted into strings. You can now use the numbers array to create an array of string values by passing a closure expression to the array's map method as a trailing closure. The map method calls the closure expression once for each item in the array. You do not need to specify the type of the closure's input parameter, number, because the type can be inferred from the values in the array to be mapped. In this example, the variable number is initialized with the value of the closure's number parameter so that the value can be modified within the closure body. The parameters to functions and closures are always constants. The closure expression also specifies a return type of string to indicate the type that will be stored in the mapped output array. The closure expression builds a string called output each time it is called. It calculates the last digit of number by using the remainder operator number percent 10 and uses this digit to look up an appropriate string in the digit names dictionary. The closure can be used to create a string representation of any integer greater than zero. Note, the call to the digit names dictionary subscript is followed by an exclamation point because dictionary subscripts return an optional value to indicate that the dictionary lookup can fail if the key does not exist. In this example, it is guaranteed that number percent 10 will always be a valid subscript key for the digit names dictionary, and so an exclamation point is used to force unwrap the string value stored in the subscript's optional return value. The string retrieved from the digit names dictionary is added to the front of output, effectively building a string version of the number in reverse. The expression number percent 10 gives a value of 6 for 16, 8 for 58, and 0 for 510. The number variable is then divided by 10. Because it is an integer, it is rounded down during the division, so 16 becomes 1, 58 becomes 5, and 510 becomes 51. The process is repeated until number is equal to 0, at which point the output string is returned by the closure and is added to the output array by the map method. The use of trailing closure syntax in this example neatly encapsulates the closure's functionality immediately after the function that the closure supports without needing to wrap the entire closure within the map method's outer parentheses. If a function takes multiple closures, you omit the argument label for the first trailing closure and you label the remaining trailing closures. For example, this function loads a picture for a photo gallery. When you call this function to load a picture, you provide two closures. The first closure is a completion handler that displays a picture after a successful download. The second closure is an error handler that displays an error to the user. In this example, the load picture from completion on failure function 
dispatches its network task into the background and calls one of the two completion handlers when the network task finishes. Writing the function this way lets you cleanly separate the code that is responsible for handling a network failure from the code that updates the user interface after a successful download instead of using just one closure that handles both circumstances. Capturing values. A closure can capture constants and variables from the surrounding context in which it is defined. The closure can then refer to and modify the values of those constants and variables from within its body, even if the original scope that defined the constants and variables no longer exists. In Swift, the simplest form of a closure that can capture values is a nested function written within the body of another function. A nested function can capture any of its outer function's arguments and can also capture any constants and variables defined within the outer function. Here is an example of a function called makeIncrementer, which contains a nested function called incrementer. The nested incrementer function captures two values, running total and amount, from its surrounding context. After capturing these values, incrementer is returned by makeIncrementer as a closure that increments running total by amount each time it is called. The return type of make incrementer is void returns int. This means that it returns a function rather than a simple value. The function it returns has no parameters and returns an int value each time it's called. To learn how functions can return other functions, see function types as return types. The make incrementer for increment function defines an integer variable called running total to store the current running total of the incrementer that will be returned. This variable is initialized with a value of zero. The make incrementer for increment function has a single int parameter with an argument label of for increment and a parameter name of amount. The argument value passed to this parameter specifies how much running total should be incremented by each time the return incrementer function is called. The make incrementer function defines a nested function called incrementer, which performs the actual incrementing. This function simply adds amount to running total and returns the result. When considered in isolation, the nested incrementer function might seem unusual. The incrementer function does not have any parameters, and yet it refers to running total and amount from within its function body. It does this by capturing a reference to running total and amount from the surrounding function and using them within its own function body. Capturing by reference ensures that running total and amount do not disappear when the call to make incrementer ends, and also ensures that running total is available the next time the incrementer function is called. Note. As an optimization, Swift may instead capture and store a copy of a value if that value is not mutated by a closure and if the value is not mutated after the closure is created. Swift also handles all memory management involved in disposing of variables when they are no longer needed. Here is an example of make incrementer in action. This example sets a constant called increment by 10 to refer to an incrementer function that adds 10 to its running total variable each time it is called. Calling the function multiple times shows this behavior in action. If you create a second incrementer, it will have its own stored reference to a new separate running total variable. Calling the original incrementer increment by 10 again continues to increment its own running total variable and does not affect the variable captured by increment by seven. Note, if you assign a closure to a property of a class instance and the closure captures that instance by referring to the instance or its members, you will create a strong reference cycle between the closure and the instance. Swift uses capture lists to break these strong reference cycles. For more information, see strong reference cycles for closures. Closures are reference types. In the example above, increment by seven and increment by 10 are constants. But the closures these constants refer to are still able to increment the running total variables that they have captured. This is because functions and closures are reference types. Whenever you assign a function or a closure to a constant or a variable, you are actually setting that constant or variable to be a reference to the function or closure. In the example above, it is the choice of closure that increment by 10 refers to that is constant and not the contents of the closure itself. 
This also means that if you assign a closure to two different constants or variables, both of those constants or variables refer to the same closure. This example shows that calling also increment by 10 is the same as calling increment by 10. Because both of them refer to the same closure, they both increment and return the same running total. Escaping closures. A closure is said to escape a function when the closure is passed as an argument to the function, but is called after the function returns. When you declare a function that takes a closure as one of its parameters, you can write at escaping before the parameters typed indicate that the closure is allowed to escape. One way that a closure can escape is by being stored in a variable that is defined outside the function. As an example, many functions that start an asynchronous operation take a closure argument as a completion handler. The function returns after it starts the operation, but the closure is not called until the operation is completed. The closure needs to escape to be called later. The sum function with escaping closure function takes a closure as its argument and adds it to an array that is declared outside the function. If you did not mark the parameter of this function with at escaping, you would get a compile time error. An escaping closure that refers to self needs special consideration if self refers to an instance of a class. Capturing self in an escaping closure makes it easy to accidentally create a strong reference cycle. For information about reference cycles, see automatic reference counting. Normally, a closure captures variables implicitly by using them in the body of the closure, but in this case you need to be explicit. If you want to capture self, write self explicitly when you use it, or include self in the closure's capture list. Writing self explicitly lets you express your intent and reminds you to confirm that there is not a reference cycle. For example, in this code, the closure passed to some function with escaping closure refers to self explicitly. In contrast, the closure passed to some function with non-escaping closure is a non-escaping closure, which means it can refer to self implicitly. Here is a version of do something that captures self by including it in the closure's capture list and then refers to self implicitly. If self is an instance of a structure or an enumeration, you can always refer to self implicitly. However, an escaping closure cannot capture a mutable reference to self when self is an instance of a structure or an enumeration. Structures and enumerations do not allow shared mutability as discussed in structures and enumerations are value types. The call to some function with escaping closure function in, the, in this example is an error because it is inside a mutating method, so self is mutable. That violates the rule that escaping closures cannot capture a mutable reference to self for structures. Auto closures. An auto closure is a closure that is automatically created to wrap an expression that is being passed as an argument to a function. It does not take any arguments, and when it is called, it returns the value of the expression that is wrapped inside of it. This syntactic convenience lets you omit braces around a function's parameter by writing a normal expression instead of an explicit closure. It is common to call functions that take auto closures, but it is not common to implement that kind of function. For example, the assert function takes an auto closure for its condition and message parameters. Its condition parameter is evaluated only in debug builds, and its message parameter is evaluated only if condition is false. An auto closure lets you delay evaluation because the code inside is not run until you call the closure. Delaying evaluation is useful for code that has side effects or is computationally expensive because it lets you control when the code is evaluated. This code shows how a closure delays evaluation. Even though the first element of the customer's inline array is removed by the code inside this closure, the array element is not removed until the closure is actually called. If the closure is never called, the expression inside the closure is never evaluated, which means the array element is never removed. Note that the type of customer provider is not string, but void return string, a function with no parameters that returns a string. You get the same behavior of delayed evaluation when you pass a closure as an argument to a function. The serve customer function in this listing takes an explicit closure that returns a customer's name. 
This version of serve customer performs the same operation, but instead of taking an explicit closure, it takes an auto closure by marking its parameter type with the auto closure attribute. Now you can call the function as if it took a string argument instead of a closure. The argument is automatically converted to a closure because the customer provider parameters type is marked with the auto closure attribute. Note. Overusing autoclosures can make your code hard to understand. The context and function name should make it clear that evaluation is being deferred. If you want an autoclosure that is allowed to escape, use both the autoclosure and escaping attributes. The escaping attribute is described earlier in escaping closures. In this code, instead of calling the closure passed to it as its customer provider argument, the collect customer providers function appends the closure to the customer provider array. The array is declared outside the scope of the function, which means the closures in the array can be executed after the function returns. As a result, the value of the customer provider argument must be allowed to escape the function's scope.